very much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to take you through some um, about uh, a use case that we developed. Uh, we've done KYC both here in Singapore last year, also in the wider uh, Middle East and even the Pacific region. So blockchain enables KYC gives you greater transparency. It can help with operational efficiencies and it allows you to keep your customer data up to date. So worldwide, there's 30,000 retail banks, and every day new customers come into the bank and they want to be onboarded. They have to go through the same process of submitting their KYC information, their basic biographic data, their biometric data, some proof of address, proof of income. All of these documents have to be processed, normally in a paper-based process, some electronic, some PDFs. It's very, very time-consuming. It's prone to errors, and it's something that has to happen in common across all of these different financial services um, sectors. So we looked at the problem statements around KYC, and we wanted to understand why the process is so cumbersome, why it's so reliant on paper-based processes, so repetitive, etc. We then looked at a, a very simple concept that we could develop around retail banking, consumer KYC, so not the complexities of maybe corporate KYC, bonds, etc just focusing first on the retail consumer market. And then we looked at technologies, innovative ways that we could enable that through um, blockchain technology, smart contracts, enabling digital security, and empowering the consumer to take charge of their data. So the existing processes for KYC are, as I mentioned, cumbersome. So the, the cost involved, the, the man hours taken to process these data, to scan the documents, to validate those documents are correct, not forged. It takes an awful lot of time. Um, some estimates say about 70% of front office staff time is spent doing KYC, which could be automated. It could be made much more um, seamless. It's also a really bad consumer experience. I'm new to Singapore. I've been here eight months. So I've just gone through the process of moving from the UK to Singapore and going through KYC dozens and dozens of times for all of the services and products I need. In Singapore, we have MyInfo, which is obviously streamlines some of the process, but it's still um, very, very manual. Like three weeks ago, I signed up for a new bank account. Just yesterday, someone emailed me from there asking for pay slips, for example. It's taken three weeks to do that. It should be something that's much faster, much more electronic if I'm empowered as a consumer to share that data uh, transparently. So in the regions that we looked at this, it was quite common, not just in Asia Pacific, in the Western as well. It's, all of these processes are the same. Regulators have requirements on the types of data that you have to collect and the types of proofs that you have to do for the onboarding process. Once you've onboarded that customer, there are internal processes to assess the person's risk and then determine if you want to open an account for that customer. Later in the KYC process, you've got things like refresh, which could happen every six to 12 months. Again, it's a very cumbersome process. Lastly, you've got the closure process where the customer is closing their account and moving to another country. Again, all of these processes involve a lot of manual work. So when we looked at what a KYC utility would look like, we saw that there'd be different parties. There's the, the, cus the customer themselves, the consumers, the contributors who feed data into the system, the regulators who might just want to observe the system and get some confidence that KYC policies are being followed and have an audit trail to understand when incidents occur. And then there's third-party data sources. In Singapore, it might be MyInfo. In another territory, it could be, again, uh, a central source of um, personal information. In the UK, for example, it could be the Passport or Driving License Association. So one of the key requirements we wanted to enforce is GDPR-type compliance, being able to meet our data requirements, data governance requirements. We also wanted to empower the consumers and the customers to take charge of their data so they can provide consent, and then in response to that consent, the data is shared transparently to the requesting party, be it a bank, insurance company, telco, et cetera. We then looked at the, the benefits that would be given to these stakeholders by using a KYC utility. Obviously, the regulators can have a real-time view of all of these um, uh, KYCs that are being performed and have a degree of confidence that they are being performed correctly, the correct types of data are being collected, and it increases the standard of KYC across the sector. For the consortium members, the financial services institutes, it's reducing their costs by providing automation. It also reduces risks by performing some of the validations for them. If a customer has been onboarded and attested by HSBC, could they then go down the street to Citibank and open an account? 
faster because Citibank sees that you've been already cleared by HSBC's processes. You're already in the KYC utility. So it allows to build a distributed trust system. And then lastly, as I mentioned already for consumers, it's about empowering them and making life more convenient. Rather than having to go through the same manual paper-based process dozens and dozens of times, they have one central repository that they can use um, to store their data securely and yet provide consent to access to parties that require it. While starting in the financial services sector, our vision for this could be much wider. As I mentioned, I've just moved to Singapore. I had to go through KYC to get my telco, my internet set up. If I was to get a card, I'd have to go through the same process for that. So while we've started with consumer retail banking um, for this POC, we see that the, the opportunity, is, uh, opportunity is much larger to take this to other sectors like telcos, hospitality, etc. Another question that always comes up is why blockchain? Obviously you're here today, so you're excited about blockchain, which is great. One of the ways that we've discussed this is that blockchain technology allows you to build a, a truly decentralized, globally scalable ecosystem. So in this example here, we've got three different apps. We've got app number one, the EKYC app, is talking to a trade financing app and a, a supply chain logistics app. The underlying technology, in this case we use Corda, and it could be on Azure, it could be on-prem. It makes Corda or the blockchain technology almost like the data operating system of the internet. If you want to share data securely across borders and integrate these different types of use cases, if you use the same underlying blockchain technology, it really does become that data operating system. So onto the POC that we co-developed with Microsoft here. I mentioned already there are different stages to KYC and different types of KYC, like corporate KYC. We focused on retail banking, consumer-facing KYC in this POC. So in the notional POC that we developed, we had four fictional banks. We had a, a sort of logical consortium of these banks together, and we had external parties that could feed data into this system. We then looked at how we'd implement it. So this is based on the, the Corda architecture. We took a very simple single page web application. It's quite a common way to do user interfaces. We then built a, an EKYC REST API that would implement the business logic and communicate with the blockchain layer. This was done using Java and Spring Boot. It's not some wild technologies like the Go language or Solidity. It's very, very easy to understand. Anyone with an FS and Java background can pick up this and start working and be productive. Then we developed the EKYC Cord app, the, the smart contracts that run on the Corda network. And again, this was implemented in Java. We've had FS background programmers who can join, who go through a week's training on Corda, and they're productive already because they use under, under the hood, Corda is using things like JDBC, JMS, standard Java technologies. So to deploy this POC, we wanted to test it in isolation on a small scale. We used Kubernetes just as an orchestration environment. We had everything containerized. We have the web UI that I mentioned earlier, the API tier that we created, and then the Corda node. Each of these were in separate logical namespaces just to represent different banks and then the consortium itself. We went through uh, a very simple web-based demo. This is the, the back office, or the, sorry, the front office systems for Bank A in this case, where a new customer has come into the, the, into the front of house and they want to sign up as a new customer. So the customer services representative on the far left will log into their back-end systems. They will then use the person's um, identification number in uh, Singapore, that would be the NRC or FIN number. In this region, it was a different uh, personal identifier, sorry, personal information ID. Then we retrieved their data from an external source, their basic biographic data, and then they were onboarded and we stored that data into the blockchain. In this case, the person wasn't already onboarded into EKYC, but the fact that they went into a bank, provided this information, they became onboarded into the system. So this is the new customer journey. The second screen here, slightly darker to signify a different bank, Again, that same customer goes into a different bank, Bank B in this case. The, the customer services representative logs into their systems, uses the same personal ID. When they do that, you can see there's an additional box. It's not very clear on the screen, I apologize. But it says, customer data available. Do you want to request an OTP? So the person presses request. An SMS in this case is sent to the customer saying, Bank B is requesting access to your personal information. If you agree, please provide this OTP. The customer services staff in the bank can then tap that OTP into the system 
and then the smart contract that um, validates the system will then grant that bank access to retrieve their data. It's a very, very simple use case of demonstrating how we can provide consent to consumers to share their data between banks. Earlier last year, we also developed a consumer-facing app that allowed the, the consumers themselves to manage their own data and upload it through what looks like an iPhone application. Again, this is empowering users to provide information into the eKYC solution and then also grant access to financial services companies that wish to use it. So the key success factors that we looked at um, by delivering this project was about giving consumers ownership of their data, streamlining the, their workflows and allowing them to onboard quickly and conveniently all of the different services that they need. It also provided some level of governance, data quality and standards about the KYC, the data that was collected, as well as an audit trail of all of the data that was provided and the certifications of that data that went through. It also, in some cases, mitigated the liability on individual banks or consortium members of this because they have some trust in the system that the data has not been tampered with or has already been validated by another party. We looked at commercial models for this. Obviously, it has to be hosted somewhere, whether that's on-prem or Azure, and you could look at different ways of operating it, either on an annual cost basis or a cost per transaction. Either way, the total cost of implementing such a solution was much less than the actual man-hours cost of the front office staff administering the KYC solution. And then lastly, we looked at the, the efficiency. How did it improve the customer onboarding experience? How did it improve the front office staff's experience of onboarding customers? And again, it was all about convenience and uh, for the consumer, as well as time to onboard new customers. So out of all of these, we found that blockchain was a really interesting technology to do this. And now we're looking at developing this and scaling it into other markets. So with that, I'll hand you over to Vito, who helped us with Microsoft's deployment of blockchain and Corda to implement this project on Azure. Cool. Uh, I think I have this here. Um, yeah, so we've embarked on this uh, POC with uh, KPMG. Um, essentially, uh, because there's a, there's a real market demand for this, and, and we want to test, uh, we want to push the limit of uh, how a blockchain can be in such a situation, right? As uh, Michael mentioned earlier, there's um, a whole ecosystem of activities uh, that are happening with uh, KYC for AML uh, and, and for many other reasons. And, and, and one of the reasons um, that we have focused on is actually on uh, the customer uh, onboarding and uh, customer information sharing exercises between uh, the banks here. So I'm going to share uh, some of the lessons learned from, from this POC. And um, as Michael has mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, consumer level benefits and enterprise level benefits, but there's also a larger uh, philosophical uh, or, or market level benefit that we see from, from this exercise uh, with a decentralized uh, KYC. So uh, yeah, it's important to um, differentiate between a, a centralized and a decentralized KYC. Uh, centralized KYC is, uh, there, there are different providers out there in the market already today, right? So uh, if I'm a bank, I, I would probably ask myself, why, why, you know, why go on a, on a decentralized KYC? If I'm a regulator, I would ask myself the same questions. Why should we promote this uh, decentralization? So uh, one of the factors that we see um, is as applicable to any other decentralization effort is really to reduce that uh, initiative or that, that motivation for concentration, right? And uh, when concentration happens, uh, the incumbents in that concentrated ecosystem tend to be uh, uh, less uh, motivated to innovate. And, and that's, uh, from Microsoft perspective, is something that we uh, want to discourage, right? We want to encourage more uh, digital transformation and, and innovation. So from an operational perspective, we do see that uh, this is the most obvious part, and uh, I'll show some of this uh, later, that the ecosystem itself, from a KYC perspective, is more resilient uh, you know, for continuity than, than any other uh, centralized ecosystem can, can provide. And obviously, there are uh, process efficiency with, uh, so I guess Michael's, uh, you know, 
coming to Singapore, his experience will be much better with uh, a KYC uh, scenario uh, in place. You know, I, I used to work in London and I, I came to Singapore as well and, and, and it was, I'm still servicing HSBC in London with my KYC requirements. So yeah, it is, uh, you know, it is something that is uh, far-reaching uh, KYC. Uh, okay, so um, before I jump into uh, the, the aspect that I'm going to jump into, which is the architectural aspect, there's actually, um, so Michael has spoken some parts of it, right? So on, uh, there's actually three axes involved in, uh, in any um, decentralization effort, not just KYC. So architectural is one, and uh, Microsoft uh, with Azure, I'm going uh, to show some of the uh, solutions that we have um, that we've collaborated with R3 and KPMG that enables uh, a fast uh, deployment and eventually go to market for, for any KYC effort. Um, but of course, there's also the, the political axis and, and the logical axis. So uh, we were fortunate enough to have found uh, uh, alignment in, in terms of uh, these two pillars here, the architectural and the political. So politically, we've actually, uh, we've actually uh, assembled uh, you know, a, a, a consortium of customers that are, are willing to do this uh, in, in this POC as well. So, um, yeah, uh, okay, before I jump into the decentralization, right, I, I want to show that all decentralization actually happens uh, in, a, in a spectrum. It's not, uh, you know, this is decentralized and, uh, okay, this is centralized. So everything happens in a, in a spectrum here, right? And um, this matrix here is actually very good to explain that spe spectrum, right? So at one end of the spectrum, we have uh, a very centralized situation where we have, say, one company uh, the company is uh, politically centralized. It's actually uh, governed or, or managed by the, the CEO. And it's architecturally centralized. The company will have a headquarter somewhere in, in the world. So uh, it is also logically centralized. If we, we can't, uh, say, cut the company in half. Um, if we do so, the company will not exist uh, in its uh, original state, right? So on the other hand, we have um, the English language, which is uh, fully decentralized. So uh, at the right hand of this spectrum. So how is it fully decentralized? Um, from an architectural perspective, there's no single architecture that can host the English language. It can be written on a paper, it can be published in a book, it could be on a website. So there are many architectures that can host the English, uh, the English language. It's also not politically centralized. I mean, although there are, you know, uh, from a, uh, a historical perspective, uh, the English-speaking people, but English today is used uh, worldwide as a, as a common business language, right? And it's also uh, logically centralized, uh, decentralized in the sense that if we divide uh, the world into half, right, of English-speaking people between the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, um, English will still continue as is without, uh, you know, without dying off, although there might be some uh, accent differences and all that. So uh, all decentralization project is on the spectrum. There's no binary here. And uh, many of this effort, right, like uh, cloud architecture, Corda, this contributes to the decentralization of uh, a specific ecosystem be it uh, in a real-time gross settlement or EKYC that we have done here. Um, so moving next, let's take a look at how the architectural aspects of this POC uh, on Azure is, 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 um, is achieved. So typically, we are looking at different banks hosting a different Corda node. And this is essentially what uh, a Corda node uh, eventually uh, is hosted on. It's actually uh, Azure services with uh, Kubernetes and uh, containers and such, right? So we are recommending a continuous uh, improvement cycle here with uh, DevOps on Azure because from this POC, we realized that we're going to make a lot of uh, cy cyclical changes, right? Like we, 
we learn new things and we strengthen the node, we strengthen the network. Uh, we also have uh, new business requirements. Currently, we support um, uh, input of uh, customer information. But next, we may want to store uh, information that the banks derive on the customer. So we need to have the node and the network continuously evolve, the core depth as well. It's not a, a static decentralization process. As we decentralize more, as we make more improvement, the, uh, the benefits of uh, decentralization can be more obvious. So from a security perspective, uh, from this exercise, we realized that uh, Corda uh, is very secure. <laughs> they, they use a lot of uh, uh, keys and certificates up from the root all the way to the nodes and to the legal identities that uh, Corda enables as well. So all of these certs and uh, identity keys, we are actually uh, recommending it to be stored in uh, Azure Key Vault uh, for best practice because we've actually invested a lot in uh, securing uh, the, the Key Vault uh, services itself. So um, the other aspect that we've learned is how do we connect the banks together in this network, right? So the first option is, is VNet peering. This is uh, applicable for some situation where uh, the banks are more trustworthy I mean, uh, about trusting of each other. So the, bank, the banks may be in a particular uh, geography, may be owned by the same, uh, same, uh, uh, same government-based uh, uh, fund or something. Or, okay, so, so that, that makes uh, this first option more uh, possible, right? So the more... Uh, a uh, popular option that we'll see in the market is site-to-site uh, -site VPN where the banks can have different hosting options. Right? Some banks may be looking at uh, hosting it on-premise and some banks will want to put it on Azure and all that. So we do have the templates that provide for such connectivity as well. So lastly, for certain uh, projects where the KYC is more open, uh, as Michael mentioned earlier, it's not just limited to banks, right? It might be uh, for the automotive industry, for uh, the transport, or for even like sports management and all of that stuff. So these do not really need the, the level of, uh, does not really need like a private network. So some of these can be uh, leveraging on the internet and we have the, the right template for this as well. Uh, all these templates are actually uh, ARM templates for Azure, and uh, we will leverage DDoS to protect uh, the Corda node that's uh, publicly uh, accessible. So, yeah, from this exercise also, we realized that Corda generates a lot of telemetry and uh, a lot of signals just to uh, keep the keep the node uh, healthy, right? Like we need to see that the node is 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 uh, still within its uh, capacity when transaction goes up or transaction goes down and we need to kind of uh, react based on that uh, as my continuous uh, DevOps cycle earlier. So we support uh, these Log4j, Jolokia and JMX uh, uh, signals from, from Coda, from a Coda node up to our application insights for continuous uh, operational health. So lastly, uh, one of the recommendations that we'll, 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 we'll recommend is to really do this on a, on a sidecar pattern, meaning when transaction goes uh, up, um, we don't want to send the telemetry over, over the wire, right? So we want the telemetry to be sent to a VM that sits right beside uh, the Coda nodes as a sidecar, right? And uh, have that telemetry uh, synced up with the Azure Analytics uh, sooner. So, yeah, so from this exercise as well, uh, we've actually um, uh, sized some of these uh, um, requirements, right, like uh, infrastructure requirements, and we're happy to share some of this uh, to the audience here. So we've actually done an exercise to to really size the, the CPU requirements for a KYC uh, onboarding for customer onboarding, 
which is at about 100 million customers, and we realized that uh, an eight-core CPU is sufficient to run the Corda for such a scenario. So that's just uh, some statistics to share. And uh, from storage perspective, right, here's uh, where we realized uh, Corda was the right choice because when we embark on this KYC, uh, we were looking at uh, other blockchains as well, not just Corda. And uh, we realized that Corda gives us, uh, besides uh, the peer-to-peer -peer advantage, uh, which I'll share about later, it also is uh, quite advantageous from a storage requirement perspective for the ecosystem. So here we have uh, the set of KYC possibilities that are, that are possible in, in the market today, right? So there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are some uh, information, some facts about the customers that are generated or provided by the customer, like uh, Michael's address or you know his bank statements or something from like another region into this region. And, uh, but there are also some facts that are generated by the bank as uh, the customer uh, uh, evolves its relationship with the bank, right? And there are some facts that are just lying around somewhere in the ecosystem. So all of these facts, right, within a traditional blockchain, um, as all of these facts are written into the, onto the blockchain, right, they are actually uh, written as transactions on the blockchain. So from a traditional blockchain perspective, um, as we know, each transaction is written across uh, every node in the chain. And hence, you see this kind of uh, storage requirement. So if, uh, hypothetically, if Bank3 does, uh, does not have any customers, but it's participating in this network, it has to actually store all of the the transactions that happen across this whole blockchain ecosystem on its node as well. So what you're seeing here, these blue stri stripes here, right, are the same data across all uh, 10 nodes here, right, from a traditional uh, blockchain perspective. So it ends up being quite big, right? So we've done some uh, calculation here with uh, our 100 million customer uh, scenario, right? It ends up with just by having uh, 20 kilobyte per customer of data, right? It ends up in the total ecosystem storage requirement of 20 uh, terabytes. So it might not seem like a, a lot from uh, like the current state perspective, but if you look at uh, uh, the customer growth and uh, longevity, right? It will grow even further. So uh, storage analysis is always on that basis, okay? So from a Coda perspective, we see that here, with Corda, as it's peer-to-peer, -peer, bank one, if it stores 11 facts, it only stores up to 11 facts. And if bank two has one fact more than bank one, it only stores 12 facts. And the rest of the banks, if they do not have any customer facts yet to store, they, do, they, they don't you know, incur any storage, uh, uh, storage requirement. So in light of this, right, this kind of elasticity is really hard to uh, plan on a capex basis, right? And that's where uh, we tell our customers that it's actually faster to ramp up your KYC project to go on your POC today and leverage on that cloud elasticity that the Azure can provide. So moving forward, uh, to conclude the P uh, POC, we are also looking at uh, what's the future for KYC, right? Even in the current state, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of challenges and, and there's a lot of uh, kind of... Uh, problem statements out there that are, that are being solved. But lo looking forward, right, we see that uh, there are more possibilities for smaller customers. So what we see is possible today on, 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 on this POC is that you know, these nodes are available. But then again, one question arises, what about the smaller customers that you know, they may not want to uh, host a node or they may not be motivated to have a Corda node, right? Uh, so, but Coda is still great, you know, for all of this, uh, the, the, the consensus layer between the main stakeholders in the KYC ecosystem. So here's where we try to think that, uh, I mean, we will think that uh, a DID, the decentralized identity, will move uh, the POC forward to, uh, towards the right of the decentralization spectrum. And uh, 
Microsoft is working to enable decentralized identity, and, and I, we believe that this fits into uh, the KYC agenda as well. And we're working closely with uh, the Decentralized Identity Foundation and the W3C uh, Credentials Community to enable uh, DIDs where um, decentralized identity can fit into the wider KYC ecosystem as well. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.